Uh, Sam, would you kind of pop forward here a moment? So, this is a real uh, important day in the life of the Little Brown Church. And uh, this young man here is called Pastor Sam Rambo. And uh, Sam's a good friend of mine. We've known each other for, gosh, three and a half years, four years, for that. And uh, he's pastor up in Charles City in a church there. Then they moved down to Fort Myers in Florida just in time for the hurricane. And um, and then he called me. Oh, I called him and said, "How are you doing? Is it okay with the uh, the hurricane?" And he said, "Well, we're actually thinking of coming back to see the rapids." And I thought, "Hmm, that sounds like a God thing." And so I said, uh, "Went to the our church council in the church, and we hired him as uh, our associate pastor over at the uh, Lord by Church. And Sam's going to be uh, uh, heading up a whole bunch of things. And especially, we get this youth ministry that's happening on Wednesday nights. It's really blowing going at it." 25, 30 kids that come on a Wednesday night, uh, all of whom are not related to any church in Nashville at all. They're all kids from the street. And so Sam uh, is going to be you know, spearheading and, and doing that. He's also going to be uh, your preacher next uh, uh, Sunday. So Sam, come on up here and say a few things. Well, it's very good to see all of you this morning. Uh, I've been to this church twice already since we have been back, and all I can say is just, wow, this is just such an incredible church that's just kind of tucked away in the country. And um, it's funny, when we were in Iowa last, we kind of were, kind of had like the um, sparkling of the eye of, because her family is from Florida, so we're like, oh, you know, it'd be fun to you know, have our next boot move to be a, to like a new attractive place and all that kind of stuff. So we moved in with her family. Um, but there was this weird thing that happened around September, October, which we all know here. We see orange, we see red, we start to feel a little bit chilly and it's a wonderful feeling. And when you live here for a long time, you just kind of take it for granted. But when you're in Florida, it feels like July. <laughs> It's the same temperature all year round, except for like two weeks, it hits 60 and everybody wears winter coats. <laughs> um, so it was this weird feeling of just not being home for me and my wife. And my wife has been living in Iowa since 2013, and she will tell you that she's more Midwest than Florida. So this was a weird season for us. And then after the hurricane, we just felt like really displaced his people and um yeah drew called me and wanted to know how we were doing we we're like we just kind of feel lost here we felt like we were meant to be pastors and you know we felt called to florida but like there's no pastoring going on and all i can say is being here for the past week just seeing just even this morning uh, it's been a little bit chilly, but you get to see the fog and what it does to the trees when it freezes. And it's just this beautiful, white, pristine scene. And you just get to feel the presence of the Lord, especially in the country. There's fewer people here, which that doesn't matter at all to God. God does not see any church as too small. And I think Drew is a huge testament to that as well. That these small churches in Iowa... They deserve quality pastors, and they, call, and they deserve people that are called here. They're called to you. They're called for me. And I just want to say I'm so grateful to be a part of um, Drew's ministry to Little Brown Church, and I'm also thrilled to be here with you as well. We're going to try to make it as a family as many times as we can to this service. Um, if you didn't see us walk in, we have two small children. We've been married. Uh, this is going to be your second year being married. And we already have two kids. <laughs> so, God moved fast in our family, so if we don't show up, you know the reason why. So with that, I'll we'll have Drew come back up. Thank you guys so much. Excited to be here. Just and I wanted to thank all of you for the uh, wonderful Christmas gift that you gave us. We are uh, so blessed uh, to be part of this ministry here. And uh, we are very, very grateful. Uh, for all the support you've shown us over the last few years of being here, and by God's grace, uh, we don't plan on being anywhere else. Um, there's a lot of people when when uh, when I and Sam thought, oh, is he leaving? And, and the answer was no. Uh, we'll leave in God's good time, and not before that. And uh, that could be, who knows? Might be here on 85. Probably not. But uh, you know, but it's nice to have someone who's in the wings, just in case uh, the Lord calls it somewhere else. So thank you so much. For kindness, and not just in the gift, but also just, just the way out towards us. We really, really appreciate you guys very much. 
There's a song that we, we sing that I love um, as well with him, it's Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. You know song, right? You know, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. There's a line in that song that says, safe and secure from all alarms. You know, safe and secure from all alarms. And I often thought about that and thought about what is it that keeps us safe and secure from all, all alarms? And I want to share with you just for a few minutes before we come to communion what I think that is. When you look back at what God has done for us, you realize there are certain aspects of God's working in our life. We are sons and daughters of God purely by God's grace, by His electing grace. The Bible talks us about, talks us about that. It talks about how He in love predestined us, Ephesians chapter 1 verses 4 and 5 according to the kind intention of his will. It's a show of God's love, the free choosing of us by his, by his own will. But there's another element that I think is just so important. And it's a very personal one for me. And that is, we are maybe sons and daughters of God by God's electing grace, but we are sons of God by God's adopting love. Uh, most of you know that when I was a baby, uh, born in Glasgow, Scotland, all those years ago, um, my, I have no idea who my birth mother was at all, uh, but she uh, put me up for adoption when I was a couple of weeks old. And uh, Andy and Mary McCall, who we were looking for a child, came along to the hospital in Glasgow, and in a ward full of screaming kids, uh, apparently she was the one who was screaming the loudest. And I uh, went home with them, and uh, they adopted me, went through the whole procedure, and uh, I became their. Uh, their son by adoption. And so, because of that, I've, I've counseled, oh gosh, I don't know how many people over the years, uh, about adoption. Some folks talking about, should I try and find my birth parents? Uh, and I've given different kinds of advice about that. I actually was counseling someone this week, and, and uh, they had adopted two kids, uh, from a, a, well, at least one from one family, that uh, the girl I think was 16. And had, was pregnant for the second time, sure, I'd had a baby before. And uh, this was the second child, I adopted that one. And uh, I have a, a real passion for folks who do that. Uh, Carolina I used to work in an adoption uh, pregnancy center in Waterloo, and we support Hope for Life, which really hopefully helps people make the right choice rather than choosing to have an abortion, uh, either to keep the child or put the child up for adoption. So I'm very, very um, motivated in this particular um, topic. God solves our greatest problems in different ways. He solves our problem of sin through a thing called justification, where he makes us righteous in Christ before him. He solves our problem of spiritual deadness through another big theological word called regeneration. He makes us alive. He regenerates us. We can't do that ourselves. It's God that does that. And then God solves our problem of alienation through this thing called adoption. So we have justification, we have regeneration, and then this other word called adoption. You see, the biggest problem is not entirely the problem of sin. The biggest problem is the problem of alienation. Now, if you cast your mind back to the Garden of Eden, and one of the first impacts of sin, when Adam sinned, was that he became alienated from God. The Bible talks about that. It says that we were, outside of Christ, aliens and strangers. Now we've got a president who's finally heading down to the border to check out what's going on in Texas. Uh, he's going to spend three hours. Uh, he can spend three years down there and never get a hold of what people down there know is happening. Uh, which is not what you hear in the news, by the way. I've got so many sources in the border of Texas. But it's not, it's not like what's been reported. It's way worse than that. But what I'm saying in that is, is that I think it's important that we realize that these folks are alienated. They're aliens who come across the border in the sense that they're alienated from their family usually. They believe behind uh, from the country that they leave behind. And so they come in here in a foreign country as aliens. And that's how we were when we were sinners. We were aliens. We were outside of the kingdom of God, outside of the fatherhood of God. God was not our father. The Bible says that when we're in our sins, we're of another father, and he's called the devil. 
Now, it's not a popular thing to preach, but that's what the Bible teaches. And so there are some consequences of adoption that's important for us to get a hold of. And Paul, when he's speaking about adoption in the New Testament, is using metaphorical language, speaking to what was happening in the Roman and Greek society of that day, how someone was legally adopted. There was a lot of adoption in Roman society. And so Paul is using the language and the metaphors from Rome and from Greece to say, this is what God's talking about when he's speaking about adoption. Well, here's some of the consequences. The first one is that separation. The adopted child loses all rights with his old life and relationships with his old family. And so when someone becomes a Christian, the tie is cut with the kingdom of darkness and we're brought, as the Word of God says, from that domain into the kingdom of his son, whom he loves. Second thing is forgiveness. The old life is wiped out. All the debts are cancelled. And Paul talks about that when he says that all those certificate of indebtedness, our sins, if you will, our indictments, are nailed to the cross when we accept Christ as our Savior. Third thing is inheritance. Paul says the adopted son becomes a full heir of all his father's possessions. Uh, no longer are we aliens and strangers, the Bible says, we become sons and daughters through his saving grace. But this morning I want to mention the fourth aspect, not just separation or forgiveness or inheritance, the last one is security. In Greek and Roman society, that out of which Paul was talking, the adopted child's adoption was irrevocable. It was inalienable. It couldn't be cancelled. Once a son, always a son. What Paul is trying to get through to the Christians in the New Testament is that's where our security comes from. I remember walking down the street one day with my dad. And there was a dog on the other side of the street. It didn't look kind of you know, too nice. And so it was one of the sneaky kind of dogs that uh, would come round the back of you, you know, that kind of thing. So it came across the street and was like following us. And I'm scared to death. And all of a sudden my dad grabs my hand. And I thought, it's going to be okay. And that sense of security. What actually happened was my dad was, was very good with dogs. He was raised in a a farm, a country estate ranch in Scotland, and so he had about 10 different gun dogs, working dogs on the ranch, and so he was used to that. So this dog, it was a mutt, came up growling behind us, and just as it got to my back heel when I was walking, my dad actually back heeled it, hit it in the mouth, and that was the end of it. I just scampered off. But it was that sense of security, I never forgot that. That sense of, you know what? I'm holding my daddy's hand. I'm his adopted son, and he's going to take care of business for me. Security is one of the most fundamental of human needs, and it's so frail, it's so fragile. We actually have a department of the government called the Office of Homeland Security because after 9-11, uh, we realized that we were not as secure as we thought we were after those attacks. And now we're spending billions of dollars on national security, we spend thousands on personal security, you know, whether it's from a, the ring at your front door, you know, as you can see, somebody's walking up there. I want to steal your Christmas presents or whatever. Uh, you can now shout at them, you can now press a button, you, can, you actually could be living in you know, Des Moines and somebody's going to your front door and say, hey, stop it, get away. So you've got security systems, some people carry firearms, you know, uh, people worry about job security. So security is a big deal. We all are concerned about it. And as Christians, we should we should be the most secure people on the planet. Uh, but we sometimes worry more than other folks who are not believers. You know, how secure is my life? How secure is my salvation? How secure is God's love for me? Does He really love me? What's that love based on? One of the 
things I used to love and still do counseling people and some people will come in and say, I, I, don't, I don't know whether God loves me. And my response always to that is, what more does he need to do to prove it? I mean, he sent his own son. He died on the cross for you and for me. And that was a manifestation of the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So how can we ask that question of the Lord, do you really love me, when he showed us in extravagant fashions the measure of his love? I don't know how to do that. Someone asked me a number of years ago what was the most important aspect of my Christian faith. What kept me going through various things, disappointments, challenges in the ministry and life. And here was my answer. My answer is because I've always felt secure in my Father's love, and I mean my Heavenly Father's love. That's never, never changed one little bit. You see, knowing that we're secure is so important to how we live and our performance as Christians. That's the base of it all. But underneath are the everlasting arms. It's like a tightrope walker, knowing there's a net below. It's like a child jumping from a blazing building, knowing that daddy's down there where they catch him. It's all about security. Jude chapter 1 verse 24 says this, To him who is able to keep you from falling, and to present you before his glorious presence without fault with great joy, and the Bible says, even if we do fall underneath, as I said, of the everlasting arms. King David had that experience, and he writes this, um, and it's a question, it's a rhetorical question. He says, I to the hills will lift mine eyes, question mark. From where does my help come from? Then he goes on to answer that question. He says, my safety comes from the Lord who has made heaven and earth. What's he saying? Jerusalem was one of the most fortified cities in its day, surrounded by seven hills. Uh, topography is, is good for battle. Uh, it was an easy place to defend generally. And so David is sitting in his citadel in the, the city of David, looking at the hills around Jerusalem and thinking, wow, look at that security that we have. It's almost like we're impregnable. And then he says this, will I to the hills look for my aid? Is that where my security comes from? And he says, no. My safety comes from the Lord who made all of this. And sometimes we fixate our security on other things. History of our church, our denomination, our performance. And yet, the Bible tells us clearly that our security and our safety comes from the Lord himself. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 22, Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our heart as a pledge, or as a promise of what is to come. Mom and Dad were great jam makers. I used to love walking up from school. I could walk to school in those days, it wasn't that far, so I would walk up the street and I could smell it. You go halfway up the street and you smell that wonderful smell of raspberry jam, whatever it was. Well, they did the whole thing, so they went and picked the fruit. And the Clyde Valley where I stayed was one of the, the better agricultural areas where you grow fruit trees and stuff in Scotland. And they would pick, the, pick their raspberries or blueberries or whatever it was, take them home. Uh, they would pick the fruit, then take the jam through the whole process, purify and heat, put it in jars. And the important part was making sure it was sealed properly. They would sometimes seal it with wax, whatever else, to preserve the integrity of the process. Here's the process. The process is picking, making, sealing, and then enjoying, right? Look what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1. He says, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who has given us a pledge, 
of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. We're talking here about how God picks and how God makes something of us and how God seals us with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. We have been saved, that's called justification. We are being saved, which is called sanctification. We have been sealed and secured in God. And one of these days, we'll stand before Him in the fulfillment of all that He's done for us. You see, I believe who God chooses, He keeps. And who God keeps, He secures. So what can we be sure of? Well, we can be sure that our inheritance is guarded by God's power. We can be sure that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We can be sure that God always finishes what He starts. He who began a good thing, the Bible says, in us will bring it to completion on the day of His appearing. What that means is He's working in us constantly. We may not be the finished product, but we are a secure product because He always backs up what He says. We can be sure that Christ continues to pray for us, to intercede for us. And we can be sure that God's promises never fail. If I ever feel in my life that sense of insecurity, if it ever pops up, all I have to do is open the pages of the Word of God. And look at the promises that He's made for you and for me. And choose to believe His promises and choose to believe His Word more than my feelings, more than my experiences. That's what makes us secure. So how safe do we feel this morning? Safe because we're doing well financially? Safe because we have a good job? Safe because our health is good? Safe because we live in a nation? that spends billions and billions of dollars on national security or is our safety based on something way more important than that? That's a real relationship with your Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ His Son as one of His adopted sons and daughters by His grace. I hope each one of us has that kind of security in our life because when we know that the shackles are off. We can do great things for God, knowing that behind us, uh, underneath us, are the everlasting arms. And always remember that the God who is behind you is greater than any foe that you'll ever count on ahead of you. Heavenly Father, thank you for the bread and the wine that symbolizes your body and blood that were given for us. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you. Help us to know that security that only you can bring. Help us to do this until you come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.